how are things? Things are, given the circumstances um, that the world is is facing, things in Australia are very good. How about you? You're in Belgium. In Belgium, um, you know, I'm I'm living in a city of Antwerp, and here in Antwerp, you know, we are uh, categorized as a red zone now, you know, because we are seeing the second wave of uh, the pandemic. So, you know, partially we were, you know, doing fine before this, uh, beginning of July. And then all of a sudden people started going for holidays and, and then, you know, they sort of, you know, brought the, <laughs> brought the fear back. Uh, mm. And we are, we are seeing that result. As soon as it was relaxed, we sort of, you know, see those uh, coming back and uh, as a result we are in the red zone now the amount of people that are infected every single day you know uh, they are yeah. sort of you know categorizing those as a red zone meaning you know so you how can, many is how many is that i, I think uh in overall belgium has about 400 to 500 on a single day and most right. of them are coming from antwerp you know so so that's right. that's that's uh, not surprising that they would categorize that as a red zone mm -hmm. We have a similar situation in Australia. We're getting about the same number, um, and all of it's all happening in Melbourne, in Victoria. Um, you know, we, we really only have two places that have it, um, mm -hmm. and that's basically Sydney and Melbourne. The other places went into lockdown uh, and didn't suffer from it. Uh, Sydney, of course, is the main gateway into Australia, and we had a lot of we had a problem with a boat that came here that they let COVID-infected people. Uh, into the city or into the country, uh, and and we got we were good. We've had we got like ten thousand people since it started have been infected, which of a country of twenty five million people is not too bad. Yeah, I mean um, Australia is quite big for that matter. So obviously, yeah, you, know, you're yeah. Doing, you guys are doing pretty well, I guess. Yeah, but Melbourne had seven hundred people yesterday or the day before. Sorry, six hundred oh. yesterday and seven hundred the day before, which is highest numbers and. In a total in Australia, we've had 197 people die from it, um, which is tragic, but not as bad as you know when you look at that those numbers. You know, we've we've done in New South Wales alone, in Sydney alone, we've done one and a quarter million tests uh, mm. to find 5,000 people. So, mm. yeah. So all things considered, it's not too bad. It's uh, but it's you know it's just frustrating. Indeed, you know, it's it's something that, uh, you know, all of us are, you know, talking about and, and it is affecting the way business are run at this point in time. Um, and pre-COVID pre situations, you know, the companies who are uh, at least trying to go towards transformation of their own business. Now it has become uh, a, almost a mandatory steps towards uh, rethinking the business. How do you mm. see this? How do you see this evolution now? Uh, look, business has, uh, has constantly had to ad adapt and adjust um, with every sort of new innovation. You, you know, go right back to PCs. You know, surely this one is uh, this one is just part of the ongoing changing environment that businesses need to adjust to. It's a bit like King Canute. You know, uh, Canute. If you if you try and it's just a fact, fundamentally. So it's it's it's, it's, it's so many. There's, there are so many unknowns around this at the moment in terms of is there going to be a vaccine uh, that works? If it, if there is a vaccine that works, when's it going to be available? When people when that's available, how what impact is that going to have? We are one of the problems at the moment that nobody knows exactly where where this is going and where this is going to end up. If you look at every other pandemic that we've had. Uh, going right back to the Spanish flu, two years it disappeared. Swine flu, two years it disappeared. H1N1, which is you know SARS, uh, it disappeared pretty quickly. Um, is this one going to disappear? Is this going to hang around? Who knows? Um, so I think one of the big problems that businesses face is they have to ad adapt and adjust uh, in what they do, and they are uh, in ways that are not necessarily. Um, significant in terms of just you know restaurants in australia at least have to capture the names of people who who uh, eat there um you know the businesses like ours have had to adjust in terms of the delivery i don't know how industries like tourism um and exhibition spaces and and, and art galleries and that sort of stuff art galleries are not too bad but exhibition spaces 
there are people I know whose business is a $50 million business just gone overnight because he's no longer doing, uh, he, used, he used to have all the um, uh, AV equipment in the hotels for major meetings and that sort of thing, just all gone. Can you adjust a business in that to switch quickly to um, virtual meetings and virtual seminars? There are other people in the industry that were set up to do that, uh, that you know, companies that were doing webinars and that sort of thing are probably you know, get more opportunity than that. So it's, uh, it's anyone that's studied business knows that uh, there are things that come along that change the nature of a business and some lose and some win. And this is just a really obvious one happening in a really condensed period of time. Yeah, and it, it's a difficult time. At the same time, some business are, you know, um, able to adapt faster than the others, or some some businesses find a way around on on how to adapt. Why why do you think some are better equipped with the others? Does that come down to the mindset of the leadership within the company? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, it, it all happens from leadership, doesn't it? Some of it can be structural. Um, you know, there, there are certain structural aspects of business that you can't change. The trouble with, the trouble with this is that no one saw it coming. Um, so it was, it was sort of, it was here as soon as, as, as almost as soon as we saw it. Uh, and there are, you know, like, for example, if you're, if, you know, how does tourism change? How does hospitality change? If you're running a hotel, uh, that suddenly you don't have any people coming into the country, you can somehow adapt your business, I suppose, to focus more on locals. But even during these lockdown situations or at the moment, that's not a big, big opportunity. It's getting better, at least in Australia, it's getting better. So it's a combination of uh, leadership's ability to look for and be prepared to and adapt to change and some structural elements inside the industry and the business that will let that happen. Mm -hmm. And some, some businesses are going to fall by the wayside, not through bad management, just through that industry doesn't operate in a, in a COVID-19 world. And, and what, what has COVID-19 overall taught us, you know, uh, as far as uh, being an entrepreneur is concerned? Whew, that's a really good question. Wow. Um, one of the things that uh, we have an office in China, and one of the things that I learned quickly in about doing business in China was uh, being agile. If you're not prepared to be agile, if you're not prepared to be flexible and, and move quickly uh, and adapt and adjust, then you won't survive in China. It's just simply, you won't survive in China. It, it's just that much of a dynamic market. And I think COVID has brought that into, uh, into a world scale. You need, to, you need to constantly be looking for new ways of doing business, um, New, new opportunities and it's, it's created new opportunities is, is for a large number of companies. This hasn't been bad for every business. It's been good for some business. It's been our business. Is, it's been good for our business. It's been good for a large number of businesses. It's been bad for others. So, you know, the ability to, to be constantly looking at the environment and learning to adapt, the ability to um, I think one of the big impacts, of course, has been people being able to work from home. Uh, it's going to be interesting what impact that has on the uh, office rental market uh, in, in, in the longer term. But I think what it's taught us is that you need to be agile. You need to be prepared to look at your business practices and your business models and be constantly refining them and seeing better ways to do things. It's really brought technology to the fore. It's always, technology has always been strong, but it has placed more emphasis on technology and communications than, than at any time in the past. And, you know, you, 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 you mentioned business uh, models, you know, um, in the context of, of, uh, of the way uh, businesses operated for, you know, um, over a decade or, or two decades or, you know, any number of years their business is, is in operations. And, and how do you see those businesses now all of a sudden, you know, 
adjusting the business model itself? A lot of people uh, are still learning. They're still experimenting. They're, they're sort of, you know, poking at, at the business environment and, you know, does that work? Does this work? We've just, we've adapted our own, we do a fair amount of business uh, in training. Um, and part of that, well, the majority of that was actually done in a client's organization or an organization. Uh, and we would go there and we would spend a day there working with them. And, uh, you know, and then we'd say, thank you very much. And here's our bill. And we'd go away and we'd follow up uh, and things like that. Obviously that doesn't work anymore. So we tried a couple of things to say, okay, we need to do this digitally. Uh, how, you know, so let's try it this way, which was uh, we cut out all the excess in it. We really narrowed it down to the sort of key elements of it and tried to conduct it over four hours or, or, uh, digitally. And that had some upsides and some downsides. So we look, looked at it again and we said, no, we, you know, we can't cut a lot of that important stuff out of it. It's contextual, but we can't make people sit there for four hours. And, and any, you know, there's, there is more a mental demand in being attentive to a Zoom meeting or a uh, go-to meeting or uh, than what there is in actually being in a room uh, on the day. So we since redeveloped our training modules in, in terms of three sessions of two hours fundamentally, and, and they can be run at certain days. And we've, we've managed to, to structure it in such a way that the, that the data fits into those modules quite comfortably. So I think a lot of businesses are a bit like that. We're finding out what works and we've just started marketing that particular program, by the way. And it's really got a strong response, uh, not only in terms of, uh, the, you know, we're now capable of doing courses for the public, which we couldn't, we wouldn't do before. We used to do courses, you know, we, as I said, we would go into a, into a client company and work with that company, but we wouldn't have open seats and have to say, we're having a course on this day and try and market that. It just wasn't viable for us to do that. Now, this new model system is actually really, really capable of doing that. It's taking, we're capable of taking two people from one client, three people from another, uh, putting them all in the one room or in the one sort of digital room, if you'll let me use that metaphor, at the one time. So it's opened up uh, new ways of, of, of doing business that we hadn't done before. I don't think we're that different. I think a lot of companies are, as I said, just, just poking at things and, and trying to find out what works. And, you know, adaption is literally a, a slow process. It's rare that, in my experience, that any business in this has really picked on one change that's been necessary and nailed it first off. They've had to, uh, they've tried it. Some things have worked, some haven't. They've picked out the good things uh, and evolved their, their business model from that. And that's going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and, you know, when, when you, you talked about uh, transformations um, a little bit earlier, um, and um, when a client, you know, when a client comes to you and, and, and asks you to explain, um, uh, because, you know, from the client's perspective, they are unaware of the digital transformations, and for them, being digital is digital transformation, right? So, how do you mm -hmm. how do you explain a client about the concept of digital transformation? It's you know we we don't live in the we we don't deal in the domain where that's necessarily an issue. We our main uh, target market are large multinationals, um, you know blue chip companies, brands that that most people would recognise maybe on a consumer level, uh, McDonald's, Aldi, uh, major banks. Hyundai, um, Hermes even. Um, and, you know, these guys are switched on operators generally anyway. So we really haven't struck anyone that's, that's gone, you know, I want to go back to the days of the telephone and telex. Uh, <laughs> these are people that, are, that have sort of understand that this is the way it is and what digitization means. What they don't know in our sense is, um, how do they do that effectively? So how do I now communicate my sales message effectively? How do I uh, 
communicate with my staff, where I, you know, my town hall meetings are now digital town hall meetings. How do I do that stuff in such a way that's effective? Because most people haven't done a lot of that stuff in the past, so therefore they don't, they're, they're not aware of the pitfalls uh, of that. I was just reading an article, it's quite an old, old one, uh, but I was, as I was getting ready for this discussion today, they did a uh, Harvard Business Review did a survey of people, what people were doing during conference calls back in 2014. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 27% of the people they interviewed, you know, admitted to falling asleep during a conference call. A, a percentage would hang up without announcing it. Uh, a, a number of people went to the toilet and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff is still present, mm -hmm. more so. So, yeah, and that stuff doesn't happen in individual meetings or you know in in-person meetings. Um, so how do you what do you need to do to compensate for that? And that's where we get most of the people coming to us and saying, "Yeah, this is what I've got to do. What's the best way do you think to do that?" So they're already digital. Uh, they just need to refine how they do it and how they've done it in the past. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at different sectors right uh, the traditional banking for example or let's say insurance company for example this companies like you know large corporations as such are, are are very traditional at the same time we need them right and of course they also mm -hmm. need us but, we, uh, but largely we need them and we, we chase them and we find the best uh, rates and offerings from those uh, companies right so and for them they are always an elephant Right, and then um, mm -hmm. uh, and then you see smaller companies that are popping up. I'll just give you an example. Revolut is quite big here. Uh, when those companies comes and knocks the door, um, what do you think the traditional organization would have to do in order to adapt fast? Well, what's interesting, you chose the financial insurance sector because if technology has been threatening one sector over the past ten years, it's been fintech. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, there's probably been more, certainly to my understanding, there's been more money invested in fintech development um, and new business models around fintech than just about anything else, at least in Australia. I, I don't have that as a global number, but at least in Australia. The, the interesting thing about that, those organisations that industry you've spoken about, that they are big organizations in big industries and like organizations tend to be they tend to lumber along those large organizations lumber along so too the industries tend to lumber along uh, at, at around about the same pace or sometimes a little faster than the companies in, in my in my opinion so and i'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here um, but i'm going to say the industries that most suffer from rapid change are, are industries that grew in rapid change and why i'm saying that i'm just thinking of nokia and uh and blackberry uh, and that sort of thing where in, where these large companies have have been born and disappeared in 20 years uh and i'm probably going to get nailed by this by somebody's going to send me an email and say you didn't do didn't think of this or that sort of stuff but mm -hmm. uh the things that protects these industries is there's a large number of consumers who are also traditional in the way they do business mm -hmm. uh, now so it's like moving a large boulder you get moved slowly uh and once you get it moving it tends to move a bit faster so um they're a little bit protected by that you know, if you look at the, the development of technology and fintech over the past 15 years, it has made inroads, and I'm talking Australia, I'm not a global person, I'm talking Australia, it's made significant inroads into the, into the banking business. But we have in Australia what we refer to as the big four. Na National Australia Bank, uh, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac and ANZ. Their market share is actually bigger now than what it was. It's certainly the, the global financial crisis took a lot of the smaller uh, players out of the market. They've merged and that sort of stuff. Their market share is now bigger than what it has. These companies have a large amount of money to throw at technology themselves and going digital themselves. And they're also very active, very active in the, um, in the uh, startup company base. They all have um, you know, divisions that are dedicated towards finding and, and supporting startups and incubators. Uh, because you know, even I, I, I get to talk to a lot of leaders in this fintech space and they talk about 
uh, you know, new innovations, uh, particularly related to blockchain and, uh, you know, and using different cryptocurrencies. And in those discussions, what I found is a lot of innovations are happening, you know, it, even I'm not an expert in this particular space, but still getting to learn from the leaders made me realize how less information I have. Uh, and, 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 and that was quite, quite interesting to listen from those uh, perspectives. And one of the key uh, area which I'm, I'm really curious about is, is blockchain and using, using it into the fintech sector as well as using it into many different other sectors, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, for the traditional organizing, just to, just to put up their website online, it used to be a big thing in the past. Now to, to explain the concept of blockchain, it's, it's really, really difficult, you know? Uh, and I'm sure there are ways to do that and I'm sure there are approaches which which is going to work well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging space at the same time, things are moving so fast that, you know, it, it's hard to keep up with the things. And, and, and where do you sort of, you know, uh, keep your attention to, right? So that's, that's my little bit of curiosity. Picking the winners is always a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If you, pick, yeah. if you pick the winners, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think, when you look at the fintech, I think this is the most fascinating sector, you know, personally as well. Um, there's a lot of innovation, right? Um, and most of them are either in the blockchain space or, or you know, are using uh, some kind of, uh, you know, innovations around the fintech. You know, are there a startup which is doing some interesting things uh, with your money and, and the money is working for you rather than you working for money and so forth. You know, there are interesting companies as such. It gives me a little bit of uh, hope that you know uh, we, we are we are looking at new innovations. How do you see the innovations overall within the uh, let's say context of a traditional organizing? Uh, yeah, my 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 career history is built on innovation. Um, yeah, my my I made my career. I was uh, the first person in Australia um, to put flavored milk in a plastic bottle, which you know, that's going back a long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. But at that stage, that was innovative and that uh, increased our market share, you know, increased the market size by 30% and increased our market share by from 25 to 45% and, and put a huge bucket of money on the bottom line in the, uh, in, the in, 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 a, in, in the organization I worked for. So I'm passionate about innovation uh, and innovation of course has evolved over the years from uh, you know, things like packaging, uh, which is still one, but obviously a lot of that innovation is now in the digital space. But one of the things that, that seems to happen sometimes, interesting you say blockchain, that sort of fits in the same sort of realm to me as uh, augmented reality and to a lesser degree virtual reality, but the, the augmented reality. His, his blockchain's been around, I'm going to hazard a guess from... from um, from started sort of around the Bitcoin with Bitcoin, been around seven years. How you've got a date on how long it's been around? I think uh, it's about ten years now. But, seven to ten, you know, seven to ten years. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's say when it picked up, it, it was about five to seven years, right? So okay. when it when it hit the bubble, then we sort of you know everybody started to look at it like you know oh my god I missed out in that opportunity kind of uh, you know mindset. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's about eight to 10 years. They, didn't, they, didn't, they, they, they don't sit there going, I missed out on the opportunity on, on uh, blockchain. They sit there and kick themselves and say, why didn't I buy some Bitcoins? And my partner was offered a Bitcoin at $30 and she said, no, no, you keep it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's growing, by the way, you know, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to hold on to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And my, my, one of my best friend's son uh, has been in Bitcoin and, 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 a Bitcoin mining for ages. And he was the one that offered her this Bitcoin for $30 because uh, he moved over from Perth and was staying here. Uh, and he ended up marrying her niece. But um, I think now, so I don't think anyone's actually saying I missed, on, missed out on, on blockchain because blockchain is like AI. It's one of these great solutions that really hasn't found a niche for a problem yet um, because if blockchain was so revolutional, which it is, and as is, is VR and AR, but AR in particular, it would get quickly accepted. Everyone thinks it's great technology. I mean, we're working, we, we met with, a, with a, a great startup company called, uh, here's a free plug for them, Jigspace. 
uh, because they create augmented and virtual reality presentations. Uh, so unlike the normal VR thing that sits in a space, it actually is designed to tell a story. Um, and we were talking about it with them, and it's this, it's it's trying to find a space, a usable space for technology and innovation. That is the critical part. Yeah, greatest thing since sliced bread. Actually, the sliced bread came out a long time before it came before it became uh, became popular. Innovation uh, has two challenges. Number one is it needs to actually be an innovation, not uh, an evolution. Uh, and number two, it has to find a problem to solve. So, yeah, it, that, that's the real challenge for innovation these days. It's getting less and less um, space for innovation uh, for a large number of companies. I, I was, you know, if you, look, if you look at what's happening in the world at the moment, the things that will be either a challenge or a threat, one of which is quantum computing, which I've no doubt you know about it and your listeners know about quantum computing. It is, you know, not even in the same universe as our current computing standards and the development of AI in conjunction with that. Um, so what is what will the bringing of in, enormous computing power and enormous resources in reverse in regards to uh, artificial intelligence, what is that going to bring to to any space in which it's pointed? It's a really challenging question, and it will bring good as well as bad, as, many, as much you know, innovation does do. One of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is uh, obviously the AR and, and VR is something that I'm also quite curious about. And I had a chance to talk to uh, a couple of founders in this particular space who are, especially in the medical sector, they are, they are working with patients with the rehab uh, issues and with the mental uh, well-being and so forth so they're using AR to support those kind of um, issues um, at the same time you also um, touched on on the quantum computing and and I'm, I'm thinking about two different things now one of them is a uh, lot uh, more and more devices are connected to the internet and you know yet we are we are you know not worried about the environmental issues Right, we are we are connecting uh, at least 125 or 27 devices per second, and that's coming from Gartner. And mm -hmm. and and when we are connecting all these devices, you know, in addition to the all the Bitcoin miners using all the power, uh, what happens to the energy space? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't throw me a big question there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's a small one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think there's not only the energy space, there's the bandwidth space, there's um, there's the, you know, hacking space, um, all these unknowns. You know, human beings and are remar seem remarkably uh, prone to slip back into old habits or accept threats as a, as now a normal way of being you know what you know they, they eventually become a normal way of being i think a classic case of that is COVID 19. i mean everyone you know when it first happened adapted adjusted lockdowns you know wash your hands you know I, my wife described me as a hand washing nazi um <laughs> because you know so if you washed your hands you've done this you've done that and yeah. You know, and now, you know, the reason we're getting second waves is we've all got used to that, oh, it's not as bad, you know, that, that as we thought it would be. And then we get this second wave. I think, you know, connecting 127 devices, uh, you know, we don't think about those, you know, every psychologist will, solid psychologist will tell you that, that people have a naturally optimistic view of the world, even generally speaking, pessimists. I mean, they, they tend to think that, uh, you know, that's why people smoke, won't happen to me, or, you know, speed, accident, you know, I won't have a car crash. I think it's the same thing with all of this stuff that uh, that is happening that, uh, you know, is it, is it won't happen to me, it'd be someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, what's going to happen with energy usage, what's going to happen with bandwidth, all of that sort of stuff, um, big questions that uh, that 
are hard to pick. You know, I, I, I'm going to offend every futurist out there that if they listen to this, but how many futurists are actually accurate? Uh, I've listened to a lot of futurists in my life, and I don't know whether you have as well, but uh, I've never seen to, I, I've never seen see to see them to talk about what they got right. I remember when uh, PCs first came out, and I'm giving myself a uh, my age away here, but I remember the big discussion was that the invention of the personal computer will give us huge amounts of leisure time because all the tasks that we now do manually will be done on a on a computer and they'll be done in instance. Uh, now, I would actually like to find the people that suggested that and have a solid talking <laughs> to them about that. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would like to be in that conversation as well because I'm working now 18 hours a day and, <laughs> and that's not enough. <laughs> Aren't we all? You know, the, the thing is that what, what, what have PCs done? What has technology done? It hasn't freed us up. It's actually made us a slave to the technology. It's actually, you know, accelerated change. Uh, accelerated, you know, it's, it's, it's brought things with it. But, you know, we're always connected now. Uh, you know, my, my general manager in, uh, in Australia goes to places where there is no phone connection so that she cannot be contacted. She chooses places uh, because, you know, our, in our business, people are always in, getting in contact. Um, even though we might put you know, autoresponders and that, and that sort of stuff, people still ring up. Can you do this for me? Can you do? Oh, you on holiday? Sorry. Uh, so, you know, she she sets about you know going to places in the middle of Australia or in the far north of Australia uh, that have no internet connection or no wireless, no telephone things, just to get a break from it. Me, I get nervous if I'm at, if I if if I leave my phone when I go for a walk around the block. Isn't that funny? You know, it's a funny thing that you just said. You know, I, I wanted to just try out to actually leave my phone and everything. Uh, for at least one day a week and first few hours I managed to do that right so I, I'm like okay I want to keep up with the with what I've said I'm not going to use any kind of electronic device and I'm just going to walk outside but you know after a few hours you know I, I somehow <laughs> I somehow <laughs> I somehow find a way to just just to have a pick right so that's that's mm -hmm. that's how that's how badly we are affected by by the technology. You know, it's like you know, unless we are, you, we we find ourselves in a very difficult situation somewhere in the desert. But otherwise, <laughs> but otherwise, well, it's we, it's, yeah. it's known to release release you know, pleasure chemicals in the brain. You know, that when we see the number of likes we get on Facebook or uh, anything like that, it, it's known to release pleasure chemicals in the brain, and they are naturally addictive. We think it's the phones that we're addicted to. It's actually those pleasure chemicals, those dopamines in the brain that, that are released when we see this stuff that, that drives us to it. That's, uh, that's, it's, it's a chemical addiction, believe it or not. The thing is, uh, you, you said something interesting there again, because I, I used to wonder, like, why am, I, why am I so excited in the morning and then just, like, you know, during this pandemic, especially, you know, I'm working even more. And, and I'm kind of thinking like I, I, I woke up early and then, you know, with a bit of a workout, I come down and, and start to work, right? And as soon as I see the first email, I want to respond. As soon as I see something interesting, I want to see, you know, and I think that curiosity, uh, you know, somehow gets to us, you know, and then that, that becomes our, our norm uh, for the morning. Look, I think um, this is what I th we, we talk to a lot of business because we are about creating you know, presentations for people uh, and communications for people. You know, as I say, you know, you know we create presentations, uh, videos and motion graphics, but clients buy solutions to their, to their communicate, end-to-end -end solutions to their communication challenges, right, which impacts their business problems. One of the things that, and we train people in that, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the things, that, and I speak publicly, and one of the things I speak about is that if you want to inspire your staff, you won't find it on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm is that we forget, and this is, a, this is one thing that, that business in general can't forget, is that you have to give people a reason to get out of bed in, in the morning uh, and you have to give them something. And, and the reason everybody loved Apple is because he gave them an inspirational reason to uh, get out of bed in the morning because it was about changing the world. There's no doubt you get up in the morning you know, with that same view of, of you know, what calls you out of bed in the morning is that you love what you're doing, you know you're making a difference, you're, you're sharing information with people in the world. That's, you, with, with all the technology that happens, it doesn't matter which business we look at, which clients we deal with, my own business as well, 
Success depends on the people. No amount of technology will ever, 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 in my opinion, relate, change the difference that the right people make on, a, on an organization's success. Yes, I, I think, uh, you know, this is one of the subjects that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, once again, very uh, close to where, you know, we are, we are going from transformation to transformation in larger organization. And, you know, you can, you can come up with different strategies, right? You can have a best strategy, you know, that you can put on the paper and, and I can, I can do that. Right. But at the same time, I cannot, I cannot find the motivated people um, to work on that strategy to make it happen. Right. Yep. And how do you blend that strategy to, to work with those people like who are less motivated or how do you motivate those people? Um, I had this, uh, so my, I sat down with my general manager this morning. Uh, she's just finished the reviews of Australian staff. Um, and she, and I said, how'd it go? And she said, look, everyone, just, you know, she said, the new people feel privileged to work here, which one, one of my uh, KPIs is I wanted the company to be a, um, an employer of choice. I really want it to be a place where people want to work, where we acknowledge people. Uh, and that sort of thing, and and she and so having done most of the of the appraisals, she sat down and she said, "Look, people just love working here. They feel heard." Uh, she said, "One person said that, um, you know, I've never worked in an organisation where everybody is treated with, you know, with the same level of, of respect uh, as as happens in this company." So, I think. The first thing that you have to understand is that your staff aren't the enemy. Yeah, we we could talk. I could talk all day uh, for on, on how to how to motivate staff, but uh, I think motivation fundamentally has to exist within the person. So you have to pick the right people for it. Uh, that's the first place to start because some people are just not going to buy into what you're on for. So it's a matter of picking the right people, uh, and then at my I always feel my job as a manager is pick the right people, tell them what they need to do, and then spend my time trying to get the things out of the way that will impede them from doing what they need to do. Treat them like adults, respect their opinions. Uh, and, and there's been, believe me, that I've been made so many management mistakes in terms of the way I've handled people wrongly that uh, I think I can retire on my mistakes. But so the short answer, there is no short answer to that question. But in my own experience, that's what I found is, is you know, just, just treat them as equals, treat them, be fair with them, you know, create a, create a big picture for them so they know what they're doing, what they're creating, give them a reason to get out of the bed. Our, you know, and, and it starts, in, in my opinion, always, as, as the Greeks say, uh, say, a fish smells from the head first. Uh, and that's absolutely the case in an organisation. So it depends on the CEO. It depends then on their, I believe, on their vision and what they're on for. Uh, and and what they want to do for the company. No one wants to work for a company that's that. You know, and to case in point, when I my my presentation around you know in presenting to motivate had it was a discussion with this particular organisation on their five year plan. And basically, their five year plan. What was what was their mission? Was to be their their, their customers preferred preferred supplier for X, Y, and Z. Nobody is going to get out of bed to be somebody's preferred supplier for X, Y, and Z. Are they? Yeah. So, you know, try and, you, you, need, to, you need to set your company up for something bigger than that anyway, I think. You know. um, so motivating staff starts with, you know, having people uh, who are buying into the bigger picture. No one's going to buy. If you, if you want someone who's going to buy into the picture of being the preferred supplier for X, Y, and Z. I don't know what person you're going to get. I want a person that wants to get out there and change the world. Our, 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 our mission, our vision, if you like, is you know, a world in which everyone gets heard. Hopefully to our staff, gives them something, well, I know it does, it gives them something to, to, to work for, whether that be, you know, we, we're working with a company uh, who, who we got referred to somebody, it's a not-for-profit organisation, who want to put an e-learning program together for uh, women who, are, who suffer from domestic violence. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got to be heard. 
whether it be someone who wants to change, we're working with the Alliance for Plastic Waste. It's about, you know, not, it's, it's about waste plastic, not plastic itself. If these messages that are so powerful that need to, that, that inspire people. That have, I'm, I'm giving you the long answer here, I'm sorry about that. Because really, you know, how do you inspire staff is a different one, but the, the thing is paint a picture where, they, where they're making a difference in the world and they're feeling valuable and they're heard and, and all of those sorts of things. I was talking to, uh, to, to the leadership uh, again on the similar context and uh, there, you know, I, I said to, uh, to one of the uh, program manager that, uh, you know, if you are asking a person to, to manufacture a, a tire, let's say a tire of a car, then for them, it is just a tire in the process. But if you ask them, like, hey, you are make, making a tire for a supercar, and, and there's a strong motivation there, right? There's a strong reason why would, why would they actually manufacture such a tire. So, so obviously, they would get up early. And, and like you said, you know, there is a big reason for them to get up early. And, and, and that would be a, a one of the strong motivators for them to sort of accomplish their goal. I don't agree with that. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't agree with that. And, and he's, because everything's context. Mm -hmm. Firstly, the uh, first thing I'm going to do is quote uh, a story about John F. Kennedy when he did visit NASA. NASA mm -hmm. uh, and when he was there, and you remember Kennedy said, you know, he wanted to put a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said to a janitor there, what do you do here? And he said, this is a true story. He said, I'm helping putting a man on the moon. So there's an alignment with a vision. Um, you, you, you say car tires, it's interesting. I spent my, my family business was, in the, uh, was in, the, in the tire industry, but so it's interesting you chose that analogy. But <laughs> Maybe it's a wrong no. one, but, but no, the, no, the no, one. But it, no, yeah. because, it's, because it's a good one, because you're not making a car tire, you're making things that keep people safe. Yes. You know, tires make a big difference. If it if it's not made correctly, it will um, it will explode. It will fracture and, and explode. And you, I, I can there is a there is about the same size as an A when, it, when a normal passenger car travelling at sixty kilometres an hour. There's about on a dry road. There's about the same amount of um, rubber in contact with the road as a, a basically about an A4 sheet of paper. So you've mm -hmm. got a ton and a half of, of uh, metal and, and two, three, four lives skating down the road with a contact area is, is the size of an A4 sheet of paper. Don't tell me your job's not important when you're making this type. Could you keep the world safe? See, it's what you, it's, it's context around this sort of stuff. If you say it's just make a car tire, like stand there and make a car tire, mm -hmm. then that's what it's going to be. But, you know, just, just, I can't think of anything, or I probably can if I spend some time, where you know, <laughs> it's, it's there because it's important, it's necessary, and it's and, and it working successfully. You know, so you, I might not be making a time, but I'm working for a company that's striving to make you know, drive people safe when they're driving. It's, it's, it's all how you, how you paint the picture around that and all how you have truly believe how people do make a difference in that because if you you think that if you have a company where every single person is committed to the vision of the company as opposed to one where you know the key people are committed to the vision the vision of the company which one's going to perform better obviously the first one of those so it does matter what the person making the tire it doesn't matter it does matter the approach that they have mm -hmm. and i don't think you know do you leave them there and do that everything for 20 years well if they want to and they're a craftsman about that there may be but um, you know, there's job planning and all sorts of things that, that help to build that greater interest and responsibility in the company. Yeah, I, I think I think you had a better uh, um, better way to put it together. You know, the one that you gave me of, of example of the janitor. Um, I, I think maybe that that sort of context when we are putting up as a leader perhaps helps people to be be motivated. You know, what does that tell you about the organizational culture when when you are bringing up let's say a big transformation initiative within the organization. How do you make those culture ready towards those transformation? Uh, well, transformation by its nature is, is confronting to a large number of people. Transformation by its nature involves change and human beings are, find change difficult to some degree. 
some people, you know, me, I'm quite happy with change. I love change. In fact, I, if I don't change, I get bored. So uh, I've got to keep changing. But I know that some people hate change. It's always what it's got to be the way it is, and, want to, and I'm going to kick and scream and keep it keep it the way it is. But change is uh, inevitable. So yeah, it's a matter of how we how we do it. The most important thing around change, and the, where I see most organisations making their mistake, is the lack of communication. Um, you know, they you need to get ahead of the of the curve when it comes to change in the area of communication. You need to, to be transparent with people. Uh, people, you, you need to trust people uh, that that are going to be impacted by the change. You can almost bet with any change, some people are going to be worse off and you know, you can try and minimise that, but some people will be worse off. Some people will lose their jobs. You can put things in place to help facilitate that change. Uh, but the biggest problem with any transformation in any organisation I've ever seen is a lack of communication. You have to almost over-communicate and answer people's questions and be transparent and be on the front foot with it the whole time. That, that will help assuage people's concerns and fears as best you can. A lot of organizations, you know, uh, so what they see is like one of the competitors are taking this initiative change and to apply, I don't know, agile transformation in, a, in the organization. And then they see like, okay, we can also do this. Let's hire those consultants. And, you know, consultants are like a, a SWAT team, right? So they go, uh, they go in and they make some destruction within the organization. And sometimes those destructions are too big. Uh, and, and sometimes the destructions are a good destruction because they have to rebuild the organization. How do you see the approach? You know, what, what kind of approach would you, would you advise to organizations who are at least willing to transform their organization? Um, so my comment about uh, consultants is it's all care, no responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't tend to live with the with the sort of results of the of of what they're recommending and that sort of stuff. So, um, my experience has been with, with that you can't be some things on with some parts of a company. Um, so, what do I mean by that? There, we have some clients and and two that spring to mind: uh, Aldi uh, and McDonald's, um, who. Uh, who don't look at the relationship here. You know, McDonald's famously has this, you know, Ray Kroc's three-legged stool with, with franchisees, corporation and supplier, who don't look on you as, an, as a one-off transaction. In other words, they, the definite sense of working with, with organisations like that and others I could name is that they're with you and, and with any relationship, you know, if in a personal relationship, if you think this is the, the, that the person you're seeing or dating or whatever is gonna be a long-term relationship, you're gonna put a lot more into it. And that's the same happens in business. We are dealing with, uh, with one of Australia's largest food retailers at the moment, uh, Coles, GJ Coles, it used to be GJ Coles, I think it's GJ anymore, but Coles. Now, having come up through the FMCG dealing with Coles and Woolworths, they had an awful reputation as being, as grinding their suppliers down to, down to you know, it was because they so, they so dominated the market, those two retailers had 80% of the market. So if you wanted to have any success, you had to have distribution in those two. And they had a reputation for grinding down their, their suppliers. To, to one point in Australia actually got to a political inquiry. And we recently started dealing with them around their attitude towards recyclable uh, home brand packaging. We're doing some work with them in that. And they did say, um, and, and the, the person that's working with it also has a background in FMCG. And he, um, and, they, they, and he said to them once, he said, you, you know, you're giving me a bit of a run around here, uh, which was very upfront for them, which is good, which is what we encourage. But, and they said, look, we're really, really sorry. We're guilty of that. We've been guilty of that in the past. And if you run into that again, we do that to you again, please tell us because it's not who we are. It's not who we want to be. My point I'm trying to make is, in answer to your question, is if, you, if, if transformation is part of a manipulation, if transformation is uh, done without any uh, concern about the people that it's going to impact, 
if, if all you are is, you know, we're here about the money, then you're going to get a reaction that is consistent with that. So, you know, you're going to, you know, if, if people just feel you've, you've used me and you're abusing me, then that's the, you're going to get a used and abused reaction back from that. So tra managing transformation is one of the biggest challenges any manager has to face, but it has to be done coming from a place that's consistent with, with who you are and not just in you know, a cold, hard, you know, dollars and, dollars and cents things about. I don't think society accepts that anymore. So it, you know, it, it's, it, what am I saying is, you know, how do you handle transformation? Handle it A, consistent with your values and you're gonna handle a lot better if your values are, you know, that you are a part of, your, part of a society in which you live both with the people and other organisations and other stakeholders in it. And you treat them as you would expect to be treated in the same situation. And one thing that we have noticed, you know, uh, within the last decade or so, is we are seeing, within the organisation, we are seeing more of a, uh, a, a culture, you know, that used to be a homogeneous culture to sort of, you know, getting more towards a heterogeneous culture. Is that seen within the Australian context? I, I think I might be reflecting something that's certain the Western world phenomenon is, it's interesting you say a heterogeneous culture. We're, we're, we're it's interesting, we're, we're, we're we have conflicting messages here, don't we? I mean, we have a greater acceptance about gay marriage and LGBTQ2 and, and you know, Black Lives Matter and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also intolerant about people who are not in, you know, that are not so uh, aligned with that particular viewpoint. So we're actually getting uh, we're getting more heterogeneous, but less in in some areas less um, forgiving of people who don't have those same opinions. It's very hard these days in certain non politically correct areas to even have a debate or a, or a, or a level headed discussion about it without personal abuse and cancel culture uh, coming out uh, and shutting down the conversation around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what, what, we, what we are, you know, trying to get to is, is more on, in terms of diversity, right? You know, if you're having uh, a, a more heterogeneous culture, then then perhaps you are considered as a, a diverse, you know, organization that you are accepting all the views and, and, and you're respecting all the different uh, backgrounds and so forth, right? So it's not being dominated by one particular uh, views. Of, and, and, you know, there's more research being done about whether or not, you know, heterogeneous culture creates better innovations or, or there's a more rapid innovation with those with those companies or organizations which are adopting those uh, you know, structural decisions. How do you see those affecting the innovation? Well, research is, is I used to, in one, one stage of my life, I used to lecture in organizational behavior, unfortunately, at a couple of the universities here. Uh, one of the things that was very, uh, very well researched was that uh, highly diverse and heterogeneous cultures have far better problem solving skills uh, than ones that don't. And innovation and transformation uh, are literally really those cases of problem solving skills. So I personally think uh, in my culture, I have in my company, I have a you know, massive range of, uh, of different cultures, not because I set out to get different cultures. I just tried to get the best people. Um, so I think you know, transformation and diversity inside an organization are, go hand in hand and innovation. Lee, uh, finally, how, how would you explain what uh, Lee Featherby does? You know, you're talking about me or my company? As an as a, uh, entrepreneur or your company, you know, you could give us a little bit of a background there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my company, Powerful Points, um, creates high-end presentations, videos, motion graphics uh, for business. We, our real strength and one of the things that we've been developing over the years uh, has been the um the need for content so we create presentations motion graphics videos for for the top end of town uh, for anybody but we focus on the top end of town and our real strength is in the area of messaging and this came about largely because uh, when i started this business we only did presentations 
And what I found was that if people didn't put put everything on their slides and there's not news to anybody and, and they've all sat through that and we still sit through that. So our strength really is about understanding uh, the messaging processes. So we, my, as I said, our, our business mission is a world where everyone gets heard and, and, our, and, and uh, to be an employer of choice. We just, uh, we just want to make a difference in, in, with the people we work with. We want to, you know, our commit, one of our commitments is whenever we go and see a, a new client, we always leave them better informed them about, what, about their business and about how they can communicate than, than what we do, uh, than what they were before they saw us. So you know, we, that's, that's where we want to add value. And we know we add value. Like I'm really, really, really clear. Uh, you know, our clients tell us that we add value. We, 89% of our clients said that we made a significant difference to, to, to the value of their projects. So that's what we do. Uh, and we do it every day and we love what we do. And we're fascinated by the range of different industries that we get to work for and the range of different problems. And, you know, we will work with internal comms, we'll work with marketing, we'll work with sales. Uh, we work with HR, we work with finance. Uh, and we work with you know people that one we did a presentation once with a guy who uh, to explain how they caught Lance Armstrong to and to uh, a tender response for three billion dollars worth of superannuation funding. So we really get some exposures in great industries, great people. There's no the, the joy about what we do is every day is different. Is this something that you do more on a custom basis, or everything is a manual work? Everything's bespoke. Um, we are software agnostic. We don't care whether it's a video, motion graphic, PowerPoint, EDM, whatever. We tend to bring, we've developed some IP called audience focused communications. And so our, our focus isn't about what do I want to say, but what do I need the audience to hear? Uh, as as I, can't, I did hear, this is not mine, unfortunately, one of the best sayings I've heard, I can't remember who, who it was, but I only heard it a couple of weeks ago. It's not what you say, it's what they take away. Ah. That's a good one. I'm going to use that today somewhere. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So every, everything's bespoke, but it's built on the same IP model around uh, identifying the correct communication to use and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, um, I think you, you covered quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm quite pleased that I had a discussion with you. So many different industries and so many... It's, 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 it's a privilege... You know, it's a privilege to do what we do because of the, the, the breadth of industries and breadth of leaders and, and people that we get to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I get to talk to a different leaders, you know, every uh, other day and uh, I get to learn quite a bit. You know, as I speak to you, I, I learn quite a bit about, uh, about, about the different industry that you are in. And, and, and that is what uh, the technology has, uh, you know, enabled us to do, you know, without... I mean, consider this, you know, uh, 10 years back, then we wouldn't be doing this, you know. Um, I, tra then, I traveled yeah. to Europe uh, in my early 20s, which uh, was in the early 80s. Uh, yeah. And in order to, to ring Australia, I had to go and stand in a queue in a post office for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> to, to, and then get this manual switch through. So the ability to speak, you know, yeah, to speak to someone in, in Belgium like they were my next door neighbor is, is yeah. a delight as well. Yeah, it did. And, and, and you get to know quite a bit, right? So you get to know how people are adapting, how people are doing their job. And, and, and then when you look at the, your own context, it is no different from what you're doing, right? So it, it, it is connected. It is connected everybody. And, and we feel like it's, it's the same thing that the other people are also doing. Yeah, yeah. And like me, that learning thing of, of is ultimately fulfilling. It's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. It's a really, really good book. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the best books I've read in the past 10 years because it really does break out this, uh, you know, this what fulfills and satisfies us as human beings. You know? and, and a lot of it is, you know, he, as he says, we're defined by what we're actually prepared to, to sacrifice for. Uh, and that doesn't mean sacrificing a martyr, but you know, you spend eighteen is you spend eighteen hours a day doing what you're doing, because it defines you. Uh, it, it's it's what you're committed to. It's the you know, we as human beings are truly only ever happy when we're when we're overcoming problems. 
being being you know having a billion dollars and living on a boat and traveling around the world is actually not a fulfilling life it's not a source of happiness it's a source more of depression and sadness the true fulfillment of human beings comes from facing and overcoming challenges it's a really really good book i'm i'm definitely going to have a look at it it looks like it has a very good rating as well um yeah it has it has four out of five ratings so which is which yeah. is really really interesting yes i'm going to check it out I read 40 to 50 books a year. Mm -hmm. Some of them are novels, uh, some of them are, and that's one of the best books I've read uh, in a long, long time. Great to easy read, humorous, um, but also very insightful about you know, what it means to be human. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give it a try. Uh, okay, Lee, thank you uh, for joining this session once again. Uh, it was a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm sure your company would do uh, more uh interesting stuff in the in the future and i wish you all the best in whatever you're doing uh, i hope Thank to talk to you again in the future uh, have and some... yeah in the new interesting insights uh, at that point in time yeah, look forward to it i've enjoyed it as well too thank you for uh listening to me i hope i've given you something uh, some food for thought absolutely you've given a lot of a lot of things that i need to now digest and, and put it together <laughs> Have a okay. great weekend. Same to you. Thanks. Same to you. You take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.